वेलकम टुडे वी शेल डिस्कस वॉट आर नोन एज रेडियो गैलेक्सीज दिस आर वेरी पावरफुल एमिटर्स ऑफ रेडियो रेडिएशन एंड इनॉर्मसली लार्ज इन साइज अवर स्टोरी बिगेन्स विद द डिस्कवरी ऑफ द रेडियो गैलेक्सी इन द कॉन्स्टलेशन सिग्नस इफ यू रिमेंबर अवर डिस्कशन ऑफ द क्राइब नेबुला In 1949, John Bolton in Sydney, Australia, using a cliff-top interferometer, discovered radio emission from the Crab Nebula. Around the same time, his colleagues Hay, Parsons, and Phillips discovered a radio source in the constellation Cygnus, the Swan. Four years later, in Manchester, in England. Professor Hanbury Brown and his students Jennison and Das Gupta observed this source in Cygnus with an improvised intensity interferometer and they discovered that this radio source in the constellation Cygnus was actually a double source and then began the quest for high angular resolution in radio astronomy the first important breakthrough was the concept of the aperture synthesis radio telescope in aperture synthesis a number of antennas it may be 20 30 antennas are arranged in a particular pattern i'll show you examples of this or they are arranged in an array to receive radio radiation from an astronomical source simultaneously and then the signals are combined pairwise the method of combining the signals in most modern interferometer is what is known as cross correlation but the signals can also be added coherently now the response of each pair of antennas of the 20 or 30 antennas that form an array the response of each pair of antennas contains an amplitude and a phase and is usually represented by a complex number the expression aperture synthesis derives from the concept that each pair of antennas acts like one piece of a single large telescope and by combining the responses of pairs on all baselines all possible pairs the aperture of the telescope as large as the longest baseline is in principle synthesized the idea of aperture synthesis was first stated and exploited by sir martin ryle at the cavendish laboratory at the university of cambridge in england and in the 1950s and 20 years later in 1974 he was awarded the nobel prize for physics for this very remarkable discovery now the beauty of this idea of aperture synthesis is that the angular resolution if you remember the concept of angular resolution and rayleigh's criteria the angular resolution is proportional to lambda by d where lambda is the wavelength of operation d is the separation of the diameter of a of a mirror or a lens or in the case of two antennas it is the spacing between the two antennas so the concept is the the point is although the telescope only consists of two antennas as far as angular resolution is concerned it will be the same as a linear telescope of the full length between antennas 1 antenna 1 and antenna 2 so the angular resolution of such an aperture synthesis telescope will be the same as that of an imaginary monolithic telescope filling the whole area By 1970s, Sir Martin Ryle had constructed an interferometer with several telescopes along a length equal to five kilometers, and the telescopes were placed on a railway track, and they could be moved so that you got additional baselines to make it an aperture synthesis telescope. Now. let's consider a monolithic mirror such as the mirror 
of the Hubble Space Telescope, which is roughly 2 meters in diameter. So the mirror in an optical telescope can be considered as a filled aperture. In other words, if I consi consider the mirror as being made up of little small mirrors, such as shown here in blue, then the entire aperture of the mirror is filled with these reflecting elements. And the entire mirror acts as a single unit, focusing a, a, a plane wave at the focus of the mirror. Now, this telescope can be considered as a filled aperture since it contains the responses are all baseline. Every conceivable pair of little mirrors is included in this monolithic mirror. And then came the discovery of another very beautiful idea of rotational synthesis radio telescopes. And here is the idea. The rotation of the Earth about its axis changes the orientation of any line that I may draw on the surface of the Earth with respect to the celestial sphere. In other words, if I look at the Earth from a star, far away star, and if I draw a line between London and Manchester, say, or between uh, Mumbai and Delhi in India, it's a straight line. As far as the observer and the distant star goes, as the Earth rotates, the straight line on the ground, viewed from some fixed direction in space, appears to change direction and also appears to change in length as the Earth rotates. So let's imagine there are two telescopes located on a particular latitude in the east-west direction. So you have an east-west interferometer. So you have two telescopes forming an interferometer. But now, and the baseline is between, from east to west. But now as the Earth rotates, and I'll show you a picture of this, it'll become clearer in a minute. As the Earth rotates, an east-west interferometer appears to move so that its spacing vector viewed from the north celestial pole describes a circular track in a plane perpendicular to the rotation axis of the Earth. Wait till you see the picture. Now a variable spacing interferometer now suppose I can change the spacing between these two antennas in the east-west direction, then the result will be a set of such tracks as the Earth rotates in a plane perpendicular to the rotation axis over a period of 12 hours of Earth's rotation. So let's look at this picture over there. So here is the Earth, and there are three antennas in the east-west direction, one, two, and three. So that is the orientation as seen from the North Celestial Pole. You're, you're looking at it from a distant star in the North Celestial Pole, and you're looking at the Earth. So that will be the orientation of the interferometer. Now, as the Earth rotates about its rotation axis, after a while, that interferometer spacing will be like this. And then after a little while, it will be like this. In other words, Antenna, um, so, so, so that is what is explained in the picture on the right. So there will be a track in a plane perpendicular to the rotation axis as the Earth rotates. And I, as I now change the spacing between these antennas, I can cover an entire area uh, in this circle in a plane perpendicular to the rotation axis. So take a tennis ball or a balloon and draw a baseline at some orientation and rotate the tennis ball and convince yourself that this indeed will happen. So this is the idea of rotational synthesis. So although I do not have a telescope as large as this, I am using Earth's rotation to synthesize a telescope of an area as large as that. So you can imagine the power of such a rotational synthesis telescope. Here is an example of a rotational synthesis telescope. 
that was built in the 1980s in the state of New Mexico in America. It is known as the Very Large Array or the VLA. Now this telescope, this synthesis telescope, consists of 27 independent radio antennas, each of a diameter of 25 meters. So it's a very large dish of 25 meter diameter, and there are 27 of them. Now the antennas are distributed along the arms of the letter Y. So it is a Y configuration. Why one Y configuration? Well, that has to do with what will give you the maximum coverage in four-year space. So let's not get into that. Now, these antennas can be put on a railway track that you see in this picture over there. A crane comes, lifts the antennas, and puts it on the railway track. And these antennas in each of these arms can be moved along the railway track over a length of almost 36 kilometers. So using rail tracks that follow each of the arms, the antennas can be physically relocated. In other words, I am generating more and more baselines between any pairs of antennas and up to a maximum baseline of 36 kilometers. In a sense, in a sense, this array in New Mexico acts as a single antenna whose diameter is 36 kilometers. Admittedly, if I draw a circle of 36 kilometer diameter and completely fill it with antennas, it will have the resolution corresponding to the diameter of the circle, lambda by d, but it will also have a huge collecting area because the entire circle, uh, area of the circle is a telescope, a monolithic telescope. But this telescope, a pseudo 36 kilometer large telescope, will only have the angular resolution of an equivalent 36 kilometer diameter telescope, but it will not have the same collecting area and therefore would not have the same sensitivity. But that doesn't matter. But these are individual antennas are big enough that it is good enough for looking at the most distant galaxies as we shall presently do. Now let's come to India. About 70 kilometers from Pune, there is the world's largest low frequency telescope known as the GMRT. Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope. Now, this telescope was conceived and built by Professor Govind Swaroop, the late Professor Govind Swaroop of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay. Now, this consists of 30 antennas, each really big, 45 meters in diameter. So that antenna that you see is one of 30, and that's 45 meters in diameter. And they are located in a Y-shaped array of about 25 kilometers. So this circle, if you can see, has a diameter of about 25 kilometers. Now of these 30 antennas, 12 are placed right near the center of the Y, where the three arms of the Y meet, and the others are distributed over the arms. Now using Earth's rotation, as the Earth rotates, Viewed from the celestial pole, the Y will rotate and cover a very large area. As far as the star is concerned, it is looking at a telescope of a very large area over time. And its collecting area and sensitivity is much better than that of the VLA because the individual antennas here are not 25 meters in diameter, but 45 meters in diameter. It's also a very impressive telescope for its frequency coverage. It can observe radio sources all the way from very low frequency of 150 megahertz to 1420 megahertz, which is the 21 centimeter radiation from neutral hydrogen atoms. Now, 
Let's go back in time to 1970. Sir Martin Ryle in Cambridge had built his five-kilometer linear antenna, each antenna on a railway track, and that can be moved to synthesize an aperture. Using that telescope, Sir Martin Ryle and his colleagues produced this map of the radio source in Cygnus. And there is the optical galaxy Cygnus, well-known galaxy in Cygnus. And there are two radio emission lobes, one here and one there. This is what Hanbury Brown, Jennison and Das Gupta found in 1953 using a simple intensity interferometer that it was actually a double source. Now with the resolution of a one mile interferometer, one could resolve this double source beautifully as you see in this. And what you see is this remarkable picture of the galaxy right at the center of the line joining this point and this point, right at the center. So this is a double radio source. These are known as the radio lobes. Then these are known as the hot spots. So let me say again, these are the radio lobes and these are the hot spots. And this is the optical galaxy. Now, how are these structures to be understood? The explanation came very soon from Cambridge. And where Martin Ryle, now Lord Martin Rees, sorry, Martin Rees, now Lord Martin Rees, is the most distinguished astrophysicist. He's the Astronomer Royal of England. Till recently, he was the president of the Royal Society, which goes back to the time of Newton. The former master of Trinity College in Cambridge, where Newton studied, or later became professor, and is the former Plumian professor of astronomy, a chair held many years earlier by uh, Sir Arthur Eddington. Now, Martin Rees and his then student Roger Blanford, now a most distinguished astrophysicist in his own right, advanced the idea that the radio lobes were produced by two jets emanating from the central galaxy. And they went on to say that these two jets must be relativistic. In other, so this is what they said. They said that these hotspots are produced by two relativistic jets emanating from the central galaxy. The two hot spots in the radio lobes are created when the ramp pressure of the jet equals the pressure of the intergalactic medium. And the radio lobes, these gigantic radio lobes, which you see around both the hot spots, are created by the backflow of the particles in the jet. Now, I'm sure this is mysterious to you because you have not encountered these terms before. So let me explain this using an analogy. Suppose you go under the ocean and you have in your hand a fireman's hose pipe which can eject a jet of water at enormous speeds. So a jet of water comes out of the hose pipe. <coughs> Excuse me. It's highly collimated. <coughs> it bores its way through the ocean water. <coughs> Excuse me, please. And at some distance, the ramp pressure of the water jet will equal to the pressure of the ocean water. And at that point, <coughs> 
the water from the jet will begin to flow back. <coughs> that is the notion of back flow of the particles in the jet. This was a conjecture by Martin Rees and Roger Blanford because in Sir Martin Ryle's observation, no jet was seen and no relativistic jet was seen. <coughs> they went on to assert that the jet consists of relativistic electrons and magnetic field very much like whatever fills the Crab Nebula. We saw that the Crab Nebula is filled with electrons and positrons emitted by the central pulsar and this relativistic wind or plasma also carries the magnetic field because this was the great conjecture by Shklovsky. <coughs> they also said that the radiation from this hotspot and the radio lobes is synchrotron radiations. Now, for synchrotron radiation to occur, you must have relativistic particles. Well, you have the relativistic electrons in the relativistic jets, but you also need strong magnetic field. So the idea is the jet compresses the intergalactic medium over there, just as the fireman's water hose compresses the ocean water and where the ramp pressure equals the pressure of the water. And the magnetic field gets compressed and amplified. And therefore, you have both relativistic electrons and magnetic field. So in other words, what they suggested for the origin of the radio radiation from the lobes as well as the hotspot is exactly like the radio radiation from supernova remnants. Not just the Crab Nebula, but other supernova remnants about which we shall speak in a later lecture. All right. So, so let me repeat. Reese and Blanford conjecture that the hotspots and the two lobes are produced by relativistic jets emanating from the central galaxy. The jet consists of relativistic electrons and magnetic field frozen into it. And the radiation that you observe from the hotspot and the radio lobes is synchrotron radiation. Many years later, after the very large array in New Mexico was completed, this beautiful image of Cygnus was produced. And you clearly see the two jets the jets certainly are emanating from the central galaxy. So this vindicates the, two idea, the notion that the two hotspots in the radio lobes are created when the ramp pressure of the jet equals the pressure of the intergalactic medium. So the notion of the jet was spectacularly confirmed. But are the jets relativistic? Well, to see that, one has to look at this jet with even higher angular resolution over there. Angular resolution is determined by lambda by d. So you need larger and larger telescopes. And you need to go to shorter and shorter wavelength or larger and higher and higher frequencies. So that was the quest for angular resolution that I referred to. Then came the notion of very ba long baseline interferometry. So far we were talking about putting telescopes on a railway track 36 kilometers in length and moving them around or making the earth rotate and create a very large uh, synthesized telescope, but it's still a fairly modest telescope in size. But you could have a telescope which is as large as the Earth itself. So here, for example, we won't go into that, our radio telescopes located wherever you see these dots in this map, all the way from Australia, South Africa, South America, Hawaii, 
California, East Coast of America, Europe, Japan. So you have a global network of very long baseline interferometry, or VLBI for short. So now you have an interferometer, which is as big as the Earth itself. Now to measure interferometric visibilities, in other words, what you are measuring <laughs> with each pair of antennas, a complex number which consists of an amplitude and a phase. And you do this for all the antennas. The widely separated antennas of this telescope simultaneously sample and coherently record the radiation field from the source. So all the antennas receive the signal at the same time. And you record this. Now, what you do, if you remember, if there is a plane wavefront coming in this direction, then it, if there are two antennas on the Earth, this part of the plane wave will reach the antenna first, and this part of the plane wave will reach the antenna later. So when I say simultaneously, I mean effectively simultaneously. So you must synchronize the antennas so that you are receiving uh, the signal in a phase coherent manner. And that is achieved by GPS receivers. So long before GPS was put in your mobile phones and in everything else that you can think of, GPS receivers were used by radio astronomers first for very long baseline interferometer. And using that, they achieved temporal alignment of the recordings within an accuracy, with an accuracy of about 10 nanoseconds. In other words, and at each location, there was a hydrogen maser to provide an accurate clock. So using GPS receiver and hydrogen masers, they could say, that we have recorded the signal in all the antennas simultaneously to an accuracy of 10 nanoseconds, which is pretty good. Now, why are you restricted only to 10 nanoseconds? Why can't you observe for longer? That is because the atmosphere is boiling and therefore <clears throat> coherently adding the signals all over the Earth is limited to a very short time, which is determined by the time scale of the fluctuation of the phase arising in the atmosphere due to the turbulence in the atmosphere. So the, uh, uh, otherwise the sources will twinkle. So you want to restrict the observation time to within the time scale where atmospheric phase fluctuation due to atmospheric turbulence is minimal. After the observation, the recordings from all these observatories was brought, are brought, a magnetic tape in the old days, was brought to a central analyzing observatory. The observations are aligned in time, and the signals from the various antennas uh, um, are then uh, coherently added, and the uh, fringe visibilities are obtained. Now, here is an example of what you can do with a very long baseline intercontinental interferometer. This is Cygnus A, and this is the central source. And there was a jet that Martin Ryle, I'm sorry, VLA had discovered, which Rees and Blanford had conjectured way back in 1974. This is observation at a wavelength of six centimeters. That little double arrow there is about 40,000 light years in size. So you're looking at a separation of hundreds of thousands of light years. So the two hotspots are separated by many hundreds of thousands of light years. Mind boggling indeed. So now with VLBI at 18 centimeter, that little spot over there has now been resolved to a much higher angular resolution and now you see the scale is, this is only about 270 light years. 
And now by going to even shorter wavelength of 1.3 centimeters, that central region can now be resolved into even finer structures. And by going to 7 millimeter, which is technically a great achievement, that central region is now expanded. And that is merely four light years. In other words, this is only about 10 or 12 light years. So from hundreds of thousands of light years, we have been able to now look at the central engine with a resolution where you can point to something like 10 light years, which is a remarkable achievement. So <clears throat> here are some pictures of radio galaxies. This is the spectacular Centaurus A. This is the galaxy Centaurus A. These are the, re the relativistic jets. And this is the radio lobe. And this is the radio lobe. This doesn't mean that this jet is shorter. Please remember, it depends upon the orientation. Okay, so what <clears throat> this clearly says that one jet is coming roughly in our direction, the other jet is going in the opposite direction. So here is uh, an example at, at various wavelengths. Here is the central galaxy, and this is the image in the infrared. Now this is the radio image. You clearly see the jet and the radio lobes. This entire galaxy is that central point over there. And that is an X-ray image at the very central region, right next to the black hole. And you see the jet now in X-rays. Here you saw the jet in radio. Here you're seeing the jet in X-rays. And here is a combined picture of the jet all the way from the central black hole out thousands and thousands of light years or hundreds of thousands of light years. You see that in the image, which is a synthesized image, combined image of radio observations and X-ray observations. Now here is the quasar 3C31. 31st quasar in the third Cambridge catalog. Now the central region is now expanded to this picture on the right using VLBI observations with very high angular resolution. Here is another example, uh, another picture of the same thing. Now I want to show you some radio galaxies which do not have jets going out in both directions, or we do not see jets going out in both directions. There must be jets going out in both directions because the lobes are there, the hotspots are there, but you don't see the jet. So let's look at some example. This is the grand old M87, the giant elliptical galaxy, which we shall discuss in the next lecture. And what you see there, is a radio image of the central. And, and, and there you see in the visible image of the galaxy, the optical jet that was discovered long, long time ago. And there is the radio jet. This is the jet in X-rays. This is the radio jet. And this is the Hubble Space Telescope jet in the visible region. So the jet from the central giant black hole in the elliptical galaxy M87 is seen over the entire electromagnetic spectrum and it produces spectacular radio lobes. But you notice that we see only jet in one direction, although the radio lobe is clearly seen in both directions. Let's look at some other example. This is 3C175, a radio galaxy. Here are the hotspots and the radio lobes and you see jet only in one direction. Here is 3C334. Again, you see jet only in one direction, but quite clearly the jet is there in both directions because you see the hotspot and the radio lobe in both directions. <clears throat> Here is the granddaddy of all, the galaxy NGC 6251. The distance between the two radio lobes is many millions of light years across, many millions of light years across. 
Here is one megaparsec, which is three million light years. Now that is the jet expanded with high angular resolution observation. That is 100,000 parsecs, 300,000 light years. Now that central spot expanded even further. And this is just one parsec. So that is just a few light years. So this is incredible observation. And here this tells you this length, I mean the resolution and angular resolution. This is several arc minutes. This is one arc minutes. This is 0 0.1 arc second. Arc second is 160th of an arc minute. So incredibly high angular resolution. And you see detailed structures in the relativistic jets these beautiful knots that you see, that's only possible by <clears throat> doing this VLBI observations at very high frequencies with very large intercontinental baselines. Now, I explained to you in one of the early lectures when we discussed special theory of relativity, how one-sided jets are to be understood. So let me quickly explain that. In many radio galaxies, only one jet is seen. There is consensus that the jets emanate from supermassive black hole at the core of the central elliptical galaxy. One suggestion which had been made is the jet switches from this direction to that direction. It flip, flop, flip, flop, flip, flop. But that idea is no longer taken very seriously because one didn't one couldn't come up with a credible reason for why the jet should flip and flop. A more plausible explanation is that there's a Doppler boosting of the intensity and of surface brightness of the jet coming towards us compared to the jet going in the opposite direction. If so, this would be proof that the jet is ultra-relativistic as Martin Rees and Roger Blanford had conjectured way back in 1974. Now, let me recall for you this formula that I derived for you of relativistic expression for the Doppler shift. If there is a clock at the point A, and here is the observer at a certain distance, an atom, let us say, moving in this direction with a velocity v, making an angle theta with respect to the line of sight. Therefore, the radial velocity of the atom will be v cos theta in this direction. If nu emitted is the frequency of radiation emitted by an atom at the quasar or at the black hole, and if nu observed is the frequency detected by a faraway observer, then these two frequencies are related by the Doppler formula, where you have square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared in the numerator and 1 minus v cos theta in the denominator. Now, in the classical Doppler shift formula for sound and light, this factor gamma minus 1 in the numerator will not be there because we were dealing with motions which are small compared to the speed of light. Therefore, v squared by c squared can be neglected compared to 1 and you recover the traditional formula for Doppler shift. Now, let's write this as shorthand. Nu observed is equal to nu emitted into d, where d is the Doppler factor, which is this over there square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared, whole thing divided by 1 minus v over c times cos theta, where theta is this angle. So keep this in mind. This is the formula for Doppler shift. I also told you in the second lecture of this series that if I nu is the specific intensity of the frequency nu, then I nu over nu cubed is a Lorentz invariant. In other words, I knew specific intensity I knew itself is not Lorentz invariant, meaning it's not the same when viewed from all possible inertial frames because of special relativistic changes. 
because the specific intensity is energy crossing unit area per unit time per unit frequency interval per unit solid angle all these things change when you go from one inertial frame to another therefore i nu is not a lorentz invariant but i nu over nu cube is a lorentz invariant and you just accept that statement therefore if i nu is the frequency a specific intensity at frequency nu emitted by a source if i nu prime is the specific intensity measured at the doppler shifted frequency nu prime by the observer then i nu and i nu prime dash are related by this expression that since i nu over nu cubed is a lorentz invariant i nu is simply i nu cubed multiplied by d cubed where d is the doppler factor which is given over there where does this d cube come from nu cube divided by nu prime cubed is just d cube that is just the doppler shift now that formula is repeated for your convenience now if beta if gamma is 4 or if the speed of of the jet is 97% of the speed of light gamma is a modest 4 the doppler boost can be a factor of 1000 because d is of the order of 10 and d cube is 1000 so the jet coming towards the specific intensity of the jet coming towards us will be 1000 times greater than the jet moving away now let's consider two symmetric jets going in two different directions then the ratio of the surface brightness of one jet to the surface brightness of the other jet will be the ratio of 1 plus v over c cos theta divided by 1 minus v over c cos theta why does a minus sign come here why does a plus sign come there that's because please remember the radial velocity is v cos theta if the source is moving towards us if the source is moving away from us the radial velocity is v cos theta with a minus sign therefore 1 minus v cos theta becomes 1 plus v cos theta raised to some power or number which is of the order of 3 we won't bother about that that comes from the fact that we are dealing with synchrotron radiation and the synchrotron radiation is a power law spectrum please ignore what i just said there is a well defined formula for the ratio of the surface brightness of the jet coming towards us and going away from us and and for symmetrical jets that ratio of surface brightness can be enormous so if you have a relativistic jet with a gamma of 4 or 10 or more then the surface brightness of the jet coming roughly in our direction will be many thousands of times more than the surface brightness of the jet going in the opposite direction this will be important in the next lecture also when we discuss the giant black hole which was imaged in the galaxy m87 the second prediction by, so so this doppler favoritism or the boosting of the intensity of one of the jets in comparison to the other jet is a clear proof that the jet is ultra relativistic so the second point that ries and blanford made almost 50 years ago is verified spectacularly they also made another prediction namely if the jet is ultra relativistic you will see super luminal motion and again i discussed that in the lecture on special relativity so let's very briefly recall what i said then let's imagine a black hole emitting a blob in that direction making an angle theta to the observer and the blob moves with the velocity v so in a time delta t the blob would have reached here and as viewed from here it would have moved in the sky a distance v delta t multiplied by sine of this angle 
Therefore, the apparent velocity of the blob in the sky is this distance divided by the time that, has, that it has taken for the signal to come. Time difference between the signal to arrive from A and the signal to arrive from B. We discussed this, so please go and refer to the, the lecture on special relativity where I had worked out the intermediate steps. Here I'm going to skip the intermediate steps. I merely request you to accept this relation, namely the apparent velocity divided by c is equal to v over c multiplied by sine theta divided by 1 minus beta cos theta. Now, for a fixed value of beta or a fixed velocity of the blob in the jet, you can differentiate this with respect to theta and see where the maximum of this expression is as a function of theta, where theta is the angle between the line of sight and the line of motion of the blob. And when you differentiate set it equal to zero, you find that the maximum value of the apparent velocity, remember this is not a real velocity, this is the apparent velocity of motion in the sky, is gamma times the real velocity of the blob, which is beta, or V over C is beta. So the apparent velocity is gamma times beta, where gamma is 1 over square root of 1 minus V squared by C squared. So if the motion is relativistic, gamma can be very large, 10, 20, 100, 1,000, a million. Right? So I showed you this plot of the... Well, what is shown on the y-axis is V over C. And what is plotted is the apparent velocity for various values of uh, beta as a function of the angle between the line of sight and the line in which the blob is moving. So you see that for small angles, namely small angle between the line of sight and the line of motion, the apparent velocity can be very large. It can be five times the speed of light, 10 times the speed of light, 15 times the speed of light or more. So superluminal motion is to be expected if the jet is ultra relativistic and if you happen to find a jet moving roughly in your direction. And there are such jets because these are the one-sided jets. So now, using very long baseline interferometry, people have verified that superluminal motion. The first one to be uh, discovered was in the famous quasar 3C273, which was in fact the very first quasar that was discovered in 1963. So you see this is 62 light years, this is 68 light years, 77 light years, 87 light years between the central black hole and this blob over there, which you can see faintly, from July 77, March 78, June 79, July 80, and if you divide distance by time, you get velocity of apparent expansion much greater than the speed of light. Here is the famous jet in M87 and the superluminal motion. Here is 1994 to 1998. Here are the blobs expanding. You see this blob moving away and away. And if you divide the distance by time, you get an apparent velocity far greater than the speed of light. Here is another example of the quasar 3C279. This blob is expanding, and this is a resolution of 5 milli arc seconds. Just to tell you, to go to resolution of milli arc second, you have to go to high frequencies, and you have to go to intercontinental baseline. <clears throat> then only you get resolution of milli arc seconds. So to observe superluminal motion, you have to see very fine structures in the jet very close to the central black hole, and you need very long baseline interferometer. So there is the relativistic jet, and there is a high-resolution image of the relativistic jet using VLBI. 
So the Doppler boosting of one side of the jet, as well as the observed superluminal motion, certainly vindicates the prediction by Rees and Blanford of almost 50 years ago that the radio lobes that you see over there and the radio hotspots are energized by relativistic jets. Now let us discuss the energy content of the gigantic radio lobe. Now as I told you, the distance from the central galaxy to this outer edge of the lobe can be as large as a million light years or more. So we are talking of an object of enormous size. The galaxy, the invisible light, is only a small portion dot over there. Now, using various arguments, which I do not have time to elaborate, those are known as equipartition arguments, where the energy in relativistic particles and the energy in magnetic field, B squared, are equal, you can deduce the total energy content of each of the lobe. So the statement is that each of these gigantic radio lobes of a typical radio galaxy has an energy of 10 to the power 61 ergs, mind-boggling amount of energy. The central engine, which you can see, is emitting energy at an you know, on which we shall discuss in the next lecture, is emitting energy with incredible luminosity of the order of 10 to the power 46 to 10 to the power 47 ergs per second. Remember, the luminosity of the sun is four times 10 to the power 33 ergs per second. So the luminosity of this central body from which the two jets are emanating is 10 to the power 13 times greater than the luminosity of the sun. Or is the amount of energy the sun would radiate in 10 billion years. Now, this implies that the jet which is energizing the radio lobes must have been doing it for 10 to the power 8 years. One year is 3 times 10 to the power 7 seconds. Therefore, in 10 to the power 8 years, you have 10 to the power 15 seconds. So at the, at the luminosity of 10 to the power 46 ergs per second, the central black hole must have been shooting this jet for 100 million years and pumping the two lobes with energy. Only then you can understand how it can contain 10 to the power 61 ergs of energy. And all this time, the jet is pointing rigidly in the two directions. The jet is not processing. The Earth is processing. The period of precession was one in once in 10, 18,000 years. Neutron stars process. Black holes process. So the jet would process. So if the jet is as long as a million light years in both directions, if the jet is processing, you cannot have the hot spot there. So what this tells you is that this jet is absolutely steady for a long time of the order of hundreds of millions of years. Now, two questions arise. First is, what confines or collimates the jet? If you take the water coming out of a fireman's hose at incredible pressure, it will be a jet, highly confined. But as the water goes farther and farther away, the jet will open out. Jet of water will open out. You will see the same, you will expect the same thing to happen with the jet of electrons and positrons. Why isn't this happening? Why is the jet collimated over a distance of a million light years? 
The second is, you see the jet because the electrons are radiating by synchrotron radiation. The lifetime of the relativistic electrons is of the order of a million years. We estimated that when we discussed the Crab Nebula. For the radio, for electrons which emit jet in X-rays, that lifetime is only of the order of 20 years or so. But let's take radio wavelength. The electrons will get tired after about a million years or so. But here you're talking about a jet which is a million light years or more. And it's been going on for 10 to the power 8 years. Therefore, the electrons must be accelerated along the way. If the electrons are not continuously accelerated, it's very difficult to understand such a long collimated jet. Now, the central engine, as I said, has a luminosity between 10 to the power 46 and 10 to the power 46 x per second. The central engine is generally a quasar, short for quasi-stellar radio source. And the central galaxy is invariably an elliptical galaxy. Almost never you see a spiral galaxy. Now, this luminosity is 10 to the power 10 times the luminosity of even very massive stars. This, as we shall discuss in the next lecture, using Eddington luminosity arguments, the lumin a luminosity of 10 to the power 46 or 10 to the power 47 Hz per second implies that the mass of the central engine, whatever it may be, must be greater than 10 to the power 9 solar masses. So I shall skip this. We shall discuss this in the next lecture once again. We have discussed this before. So this is the Eddington luminosity limit. What we are saying is a star of mass m cannot radiate more than this luminosity, which is given by 4 pi c g m p, where m p is the mass of the proton, divided by the sigma Thomson scattering cross-section of the electron, which is 8 pi by 3 e squared over uh, r e squared where uh, Re is the classical radius of the electron. It is 10 to the power 38 x per second. Where M is measured in units of solar mass. So the maximum luminosity the sun can radiate is 10 to the power 38 x per second. If it radiated more than that, the sun will be blown apart by radiation pressure. So to radiate 10 to the power 46 x per second or 10 to the power 47 x per second, the mass of the central body must be in excess of a billion solar mass. Then only the Eddington luminosity limit will equal 10 to the power 46 or 10 to the power 47 x. Now, one of the things that was discovered by radio astronomers a couple of years after quasars were discovered was that the radio emission from quasars was variable. This shocked the astronomical community. I remember this discovery. I was a student at that time, and radio astronomers were absolutely stunned because you do not expect sources like this to vary with time. It varied over a year. And then astronomers discovered that not only the radio source varied, but even in the opti at optical wavelength, there was variability. But this time, the variability was not over a year, but it was varying over a time scale of a few days. And then after many years, X-ray astronomers came into the picture and nailed the last nail in the coffin because they found variability not in time scale of a year, not in time scale of days, but in time scale of minutes. And that's what you see here. Variation, variability in 
लो एनर्जी एक्स रेस टू मीडियम एनर्जी एक्स रेस टू अल्ट्रा हाई एनर्जी गैमा रेस यू 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 फाइंड दैट द रेडिएशन इज हाईली वेरिएबल टाइम स्केल ऑफ मिनट्स टू आवर्स दिस टेल्स यू दैट द साइज ऑफ द रेडिएटिंग सोर्स मस्ट बी लेस दैन सी डेल्टा टी वर सी इज द स्पीड ऑफ लाइट एंड डेल्टा टी इज द वेरिएबिलिटी टाइम स्केल okay so you think about this if if a source is variable an astronomical source is variable then its size over a time scale of delta t then its size cannot be larger than c delta t because if the size of the body is greater than c delta t light signals cannot travel to distant part of the source and therefore it would not be possible to synchronize whatever is emitting some antennas which are emitting there so that the net variability will be in a time scale of delta t so you please think about this i explained this before it is using this argument that jocelyn bell and her collaborators concluded that pulsars must be extremely small objects because they found variability in the time scale of milliseconds in the fine structure of pulses it is the same argument so you please think about it carefully so thus emerges the picture that quasars as well as other types of active galactic nuclei are powered by supermassive black hole so there is a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy cygnus a and the powerful relativistic jets are coming from the vicinity of this black hole now with the advent of the chandra x-ray observatory it has emerged that all galaxies including our own galaxy the milky way galaxy harbor supermassive black holes now we can ask why are there no quasars in all the galaxies why is there a quasar at the center of the milky way galaxy in order for a black hole to manifest as a quasar <clears throat> matter must fall into the black hole and in the process emit radiation now if the black hole is starved of matter if matter is not falling onto the black hole then however massive it may be it will not be a powerful emitter so unless sufficient matter accretes onto the black hole there will not be much radiation for example the 3 million solar mass black hole at the center of our galaxy is a very silent black hole that's because it's suffering from malnutrition enough stars are not falling into it enough clouds are not falling into it now stars in close orbits around black hole can be tidally disrupted and the gas falls into the black hole similarly giant molecular clouds and atomic clouds can also fall into the black hole in every case the matter has to first form an accretion disk around the black hole because any star or gas cloud orbiting the black hole has angular momentum orbital angular momentum and therefore matter cannot fall radially into the black hole it will first form an accretion disk now in the accretion disk there is some friction and matter spirals in in the accretion disk and eventually the matter uh, falls into the black hole and that efficiency of uh, radiation is rather small it's only of the order of 10% now a luminous quasar like 3c273 or the quasar at the center of the galaxy m87 has to accrete several several solar mass of material every year several solar mass of material every year and if that accretion is not taking place then the supermassive black hole will not be a quasar now we shall discuss this in the next lecture so i shall skip this now all i want to say 
is that the central body of radio galaxies are of a variety of type. There is a zoo of them. They are generally called active galactic nuclei. Some are called Seifert galaxies. Some are called BL-like objects. Some are called quasars. Some are called quasi-stellar objects because they do not emit in the radio wavelength. All of these are now called AGNs, active galactic nuclei. For about 20 or 30 years, people thought these were different animals in the zoo. But today, astronomers believe that they're all of the same type. There is a central black hole surrounded by an accretion disk, and there is a torus of molecular clouds, and there are other gas clouds over there. And you may be looking at it in the equatorial plane, or you may be looking at it from the North Pole, or you may be looking at it at some arbitrary angle. So depending on which angle you're viewing the central black hole and the accretion disk, you will say that the central body is a Seifert galaxy, or a BL-like object, or a quasar, or a quasi-stellar object, or what have you. So I'm not explaining this, I'm merely saying that all these active galactic nuclei at the centers of these radio galaxies with powerful relativistic jets emanating are all powered by a central black hole surrounding which there is an accretion disk and surrounding that there is a giant molecular cloud torus. And there is a jet going in a direction perpendicular to the accretion disk. And we shall pick up this story in the second, in the next lecture, which is on supermassive black holes. And I shall explain how to understand this beautiful image that was produced by the Whole Earth Telescope in 2019 of the shadow of the giant black hole at the center of the elect elliptical galaxy M87. So that is the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.